So Mervyn King, who was the former head of the Bank of England, he gave a very interesting interview in the last 10 or so days. There was an article out from The Guardian on Sunday, October 20th of 2019, talking where he's criticizing current central bankers and the ones that were in power during the 2008 financial crisis and the ones that have taken over afterward. But before I read the article, I want to play this clip from Eric Sprott. I think it's absolutely hilarious for about four minutes. Eric Sprott is talking about the Mervyn King. He's talking about inflation in the real economy, and he's talking about the repo madness. So let me just play these four minutes really quick. I think you're going to, if, if, if you like to hear interesting insights from a billionaire, also his laugh is priceless here. We know that the, the central banks are, quite frankly, seemingly in a quandary here, okay? I don't think they know what the hell they're going to do next, because whatever they're doing has not worked. Uh, we can use the Japanese example of that, where, you know, it's been going nowhere for 30 years of printing money, and now we got the ECB doing the same, and they're in the tank, and we got the Fed uh, trying to crank things up, and it looks like we're in the tank here in North America. And I go back to the same thing I've said before. I, I just think it's the massive understatement of inflation that people have to pay way more than are, is being discussed, but they're not getting the wage increase, okay? Because the mantra is, you know, inflation is less than two. You don't, you know, you, you get a wage increase of two, but inflation isn't two. It, it's ridiculous. In fact, I, when I was at that function last night, there were t the, the guy was uh, wrote an op-ed piece about how the cost of, of acquiring exchange uh, information, stock exchange information, the cost of get, getting the information has gone up 11% for 10 years in a row. 10 years in a row, hmm. 11%. Like, come hmm. on. And that's just one example, whether it's utility bills or real estate yep. taxes or Medi Medicare, whatever. I mean, who's kidding who that we have 2% inflation? That's a joke. So the, pe pe the average guy... It's just getting ground down here and it's showing up in negative retail sales in Canada, negative retail sales in the States. It's just going to keep going, I think. The inflation is eating away at people. It's also why you and I have discussed for years that interest rates can't go back up. I mean, the Fed drained the money supply. They tried to run interest rates up to service both the public and private debt became impossible and the economy rolled over. I and mean, this wasn't complicated. You can see this coming. Yeah, no, it's and, and, and they know I think they now know it's not working. Right. Didn't I read that Mervyn King said the central bank should be, uh, get a meeting uh, behind closed doors where I, we're all going to figure out how, how to solve this problem? Because obviously they don't have the solution to the problem. Yeah. And, they, and they're not going to have the solution to the problem we, because we, they, they, they are the problem. We should quote him, Eric, because if people missed that this week, it was an article in The Guardian. Mervyn King is the former head of the Bank of England, just like Ben Bernanke is the former head of the Fed. They, they, did, they had their jobs at the same time. Let me leave you one other quote Mervyn King said, Eric, because you might have missed this. His actual sure. quote, his actual quote was, by sticking to the new orthodoxy of monetary policy, whatever that is, and catch this, pretending that we have made the banking system safe. <laughs> pretending yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Which I mean, we've known, Craig you and I have known that all along okay yeah how many times we called them zombies you know walking dead all that stuff and here's the head former head of the Bank of England can you imagine Bernanke yeah. had said that yeah pretending that we made the banking system safe and here we go okay. so let's talk about repo yeah. That's one thing I can remember this morning. Well, let's talk about that. All right. So here's the thing. Let me, let me frame it this way for you, Eric, because we've got another FOMC coming up next week, right? Yeah. And Chairman Powell's going to have his press conference. Maybe you and I can get a press pass because somebody's got to ask him and say, hey, look, Chairman Powell, six weeks ago, everything was fine, right? You were at a neutral rate. You were going to be data dependent, all this stuff. And now in, you know, in under a month, you're all of a sudden monetizing $60 billion a month of debt with this new QE. You've expanded this repo from nothing to $120 billion a day. Um, this looks like it's getting worse, doesn't it? Yeah. You should ask him, when you get your press pass, ask him, what does not QE mean? Yeah. Large-scale <laughs> asset purchase program. Oh, yeah, yeah. Balance sheet expansion or whatever that, or balance sheet diversification or balance sheet whatever. Uh, I think that the only thing important about the balance sheet is the B and the S, okay? <laughs> yes, sir. B, S. 
And yes, I shouldn't sir. be talking this way, but, you know, we've had a long night. Let's... Uh... Okay, so that's enough for right now. I think it was important to talk about that because Eric Sprott was saying that central bankers are the problem. They created this mess. They do not know what they're doing. Every time they make, uh, they either create a new problem or they make something worse, and their solution, and I'm using air quotes, is more liquidity. So there's always a liquidity trap. Their deflation's the greatest enemy. They can't allow any deflation. They can't allow any asset prices to fall, and it's just absolutely priceless hearing Eric Sprott laugh about that in crack jokes. I thought it was great. So I thought I would share it with you if you did not listen to the uh, Sprott Money recap that happened uh, on Friday, this past Friday. I thought that was hilarious. So let me get into the Mervyn King article that came out on Sunday, October 20th. So past crashes, world economy is sleepwalking into a new financial crisis, warns, warns Mervyn King from Larry Elliott in Washington, D.C. The world is sleepwalking towards a fresh economic and financial crisis that will have devastating consequences for the democratic market system. Yeah, because now lots of people are seeing socialism and MMT as popular. According to the former Bank of England Governor Mervyn King, Lord King, who was in charge at Threadneedle Street, I guess that's where the Bank of England is. I'm not from London, so that's my educated guess. During the near death of the global banking system and deep economic slump a decade ago, said the resistance to new thinking meant a repeat of the chaos of the 2008 and 2009 period was looming. Giving a lecture in Washington at the annual meeting of the International Monetary Fund, King said there had been no fundamental questioning of the ideas that led to the crisis of a decade ago. Quote, another economic and financial crisis would be devastating to the legitim legitimacy of a democratic market system, he said. By sticking to the new orthodoxy of monetary policy and pretending that we have where QE is now conventional or not QE is conventional, whatever they're going to call it, after the Fed hires uh, research groups and marketing testing, and pretending that we have made the banking system safe, I think that's interesting, pretending that we have made the, the banking system safe. This is something that the gold community and the alternative media have been calling into question. I think it's very telling that a former central banker, now that he's left that position, he's gotten his knighthood, he's gotten his pension, now that he's saying that He's saying now that the pretending that the banking system is safe. We're sleepwalking towards that crisis. He added that the U.S. would suffer a financial Armageddon if its central bank, the Federal Reserve, lacked the necessary firepower to combat another episode similar to the subprime mortgage sell-off. King, Mark Carney's predecessor at the Bank of England governor, said that following the Great Depression of the 1930s, there had been new thinking and intellectual change. Yeah. Keynesian economics, which made things infinitely worse. No one can doubt that we are once more living through a period of political turmoil, but there has been no comparable questioning of the basic ideas underpinning economic policy. That needs to change. The former bank governor said the economic and political climate had rarely been so fraught, citing the U.S.-China trade war, riots in Hong Kong, problems in emerging market countries such as Argentina and Turkey, growing tensions between France and Germany over the future direction of the euro, and the increasingly bitter political political conflict in the U.S. at a time when the willingness of the U.S. to act as the, as the world's policeman was disappearing. Ripples on the surface of our politics have become breaking waves as the winds of change have gained force. I think he's talking, they're worried about the rise of populism, especially if you're a leading economic and political elite and you're a globalist. King said the world economy was stuck in a low growth trap. Yeah, too much debt and too much inflation that the governments are all lying about. The recovery from the slump of 2008-2009 was weaker than that after the Great Depression. I would answer, what recovery? Following the great inflation, great stability, I'm quoting him here, and the great recession, we've entered the great stagnation, just like Japan. I'll add that. Eric Sprott mentioned that too. King said that in 2013, former U.S. Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, who I definitely do not dislike, uh, who I definitely dislike, and I definitely do not think he's a genius, had reintroduced the concept of secular stagnation, a low per permanent period of low growth in which ultra low interest rates are ineffective. It is surely now time to admit that we are experiencing it. Standard models were unhelpful in two important areas of economic policy, getting the world out of its low growth trap where everything is viewed as a liquidity model, I added that, and preparing for the next financial crisis. Conventional wisdom, I didn't know Keynesian central bankers have, have anything conventional or any wisdom, attributes the stagnation largely to supply factors as the underlying growth rate of productivity appears to have fallen, but data can be interpreted only with any theory or model, and it is surprising that there has been so much resistance to the hypothesis that not just the U.S., but the world as a whole is suffering from demand-led secular stagnation. This is a problem with Keynesian economics. They want to try to stimulate demand. Doesn't work. 
when the consumer is already in debt, when there's not a lot of savings, there is not a global savings glut that is complete and total BS. So King also said the world entered and departed from the global financial crisis with a distorted pattern of demand and output to escape permanently from a low growth trap involved in reallocation of resources from one component of demand to another, from one sector to another, and from one firm to another. There has been excess investment in some parts of the economy, export sectors in China and Germany, and commercial property in other advanced economies. A lot of that's Chinese money sloshing around in real estate. For example, an insufficient others, infrastructure investment in one, uh, he says there's insufficient investment in infrastructure investment in many Western countries. Bring about such a shift in resources, capital and labor will require a much broader set of policies than simply monetary stimulus. He added, it is the failure to face up to the need for action on many policy fronts that has led to the demand stagnation in the past decade. Whenever you see that they need to boost aggregate demand, it's definitely a Keynesian. And without action to deal with the structural weaknesses of the global economy, there is a risk of another financial crisis emanating this time, not from the U.S. banking system, but from weak financial systems elsewhere. So in, his, in Mervyn King's opinion, it will not start in the U.S., King said, okay, and here's the very interesting parts here, the last two paragraphs. King said it was time for the Federal Reserve and other central banks to begin talks behind closed doors with politicians to make legislators aware of how vulnerable they would be in the event of another crisis. So King wants even more secret meetings, even more secrets, even less transparency, even more lying even more changing of the rules, even more moving of the goalposts. And I've been talking about this for years. I wrote these rules down, I think about four or five years ago, the three most important rules of investing in this quote unquote new normal. And this is just my opinion, not financial advice, that one, politicians and governments can and will change the rules anytime they want, perhaps on a daily basis, moving the goalposts, retroactive rules for taxes and other things, moving targets. Number two, because of rule number one and how much the rules might change on a quarterly, monthly, weekly, maybe even daily basis going forward, people should not, quote, go all in, go, quote, unquote, all in on investing in any one asset class or investing in only one country or company, at least some real diversification is important to protect against known unknowns or unknown unknowns. The one time I will ever agree with what Donald Rumsfeld said, that's one of his only good quotes. People should focus on creating as many possible with the known unknowns and unknown unknowns, not the rest of what I said. I didn't blatantly plagiarize Donald Rumsfeld. Three, people should focus on creating as many possible income streams and inflation hedges as they can from owning different investments and businesses to protect themselves, to survive and thrive, whatever is coming in the future, thanks to the myopic stupidity and rent-seeking behavior of parasitical central planners, politicians, bankers, central bankers, and government bureaucrats. And let's add in uh, large corporate executives into there, too. I'll add that. I'll amend that later. So we have a number of other articles that also came out recently. There was an interesting article that came out a couple days ago from Zero Hedge. It was submitted by Hu Van Stennis, senior advisor to the CEO at UBS, the which is a Swiss one of the Switzerland's investment banks and formerly senior advisor to Bank of England, Governor Mark Carney, talking about the things he learned at this central banker conference and how central bankers are uh, this IMF central banking conference that was here in Washington, D.C. this weekend and how central bankers are really confused about a bunch of different things. So he shared those insights. I'll attach a link to that. And finally, there was another interview from another former member at the Federal Reserve. Oh, this was updated a couple days ago. From Mark Cabana, I think's his name. He worked as, let me get his job title at the Federal Reserve. He was, forget where it said what his uh, job title is. Um, obviously, he's in the private sector now making a lot more money. He's now the U.S. short rate strategy for Bank of America Merrill Lynch. But I can't see his, he worked at the, he was a management in the uh, New York Federal Reserve. He thinks that the not QE of $60 billion per month and the amount of repo being done is nowhere near enough. Okay, so I'll attach links to those in the information and description section. I will take a quick look at listener questions and comments. I'm not going to be here a long time. It's a short update. Bottom line is things are playing out very similar 
to what I was seeing four or five, six years ago. There's people now talking about rules changes. There was an interview on Macro Voices with another expert talking about, oh, how they're gonna change the rules. I've been talking about this. If you're familiar with my Wall Street for Main Street YouTube channel, I've been talking about this for five or six years that the rules are gonna change because I've studied financial history and that's what's happened in the past. It's very common for rules to change. FDR did it in 1934. FDR was doing it lots of times during the Great Depression. Herbert Hoover was doing it as well during the Great Depression. He was tinkering a lot, and FDR did it even worse. He doubled and tripled down on a lot of Herbert Hoover's policies. Santana asks here in the live chat, is the dollar strong or not? So Santana, the dollar could be strong relative to all other fiat currencies, and all, other fi and all fiat currencies could still be losing purchasing power. Also, there could still be inflation in the global supply chain for a bunch of different reasons, whether that's tariffs, higher labor costs, um, higher commodity prices in other currencies other than the dollar, etc. So to say that just because the dollar is strong relative to other fiat currencies, there should not be inflation, you're not understanding the complete and total picture. Things are more complicated than that. There was so much money and credit printed, Santana, that even if the dollar stays strong on a relative basis relative to the other garbage fiat currencies, and the dollar is also garbage, but the dollar is the cleanest dirty shirt in the laundry basket, pick your analogy, there's tons of them that are appropriate for describing the dollar, that there is still tens of trillions in fiat currency and credit that has been created since the 2008 financial crisis. And that money has had to go somewhere. Now, a lot of that money has gone into asset prices. It's gone into derivatives. It's gone into stock market here in the US. It's gone into bonds. It's gone in, into real estate. A lot of the Chinese money that's escaped China has gone into real estate. A lot of the money in China has gone into real estate. And then that money, eventually, some of it will get into the real economy. And that's what affects consumer prices. So it doesn't matter if the dollar is strong relative to the other fiat currencies, digital debt-based fiat currencies. There could still be lots of inflation in the global supply chain, lots of stagflation for a number of different reasons. And I think the stagflate and tax and lie will get a lot worse especially if the Democrats win more seats in Congress and a Democrat wins the White House. Although I think Trump will want more inflation too, but I think the Democrats are more likely to adopt MMT faster. And MMT could really just go crazy with the inflation. And their solution, and I'm using air quotes, to more inflation is to just tax it away, acting as if inflation is not already a stealth tax. And even Lord Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, said that inflation is a tax, stealth tax, that one in a million people cannot detect. I'm roughly paraphrasing him. Another one of the few quotes I actually agree with Keynes on. JRL, it has been rebranded as not QE. Not QE will go on forever. They're not going to call it QE because the average person on Main Street knows what QE is. Thank you for the super chat, Greg. Much appreciated. A strong dollar just disproves a lot of what the gold community is saying about petro yuan or gold back to yuan. China has immense amount of problems. I'm going to do another China show soon. There's a lot of crazy stories in China. There's dozens. I literally found a dozen crazy stories in just the last 10, 10 days to two weeks. JRL says globalization has failed. It cannot survive without endless stimulation from central banks. Also, globalization, it was supposed to move cheap labor to different countries, and that hasn't worked either. And you can't have capitalism where not only are large corporations not allowed to fail in many cases, but also there's not the entrepreneurship allowed to come up with new business ideas. So you need bankruptcy. You need deflation. 
Deflation has to be allowed with capitalism. Prices need to fall. Markets need to clear. Asset prices need to go on sale for pennies on the dollar. Um, if people stay asleep, the trade can last for years. If more people stay asleep, but I think a lot of people are waking up. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people are waking up or seeing, blaming everything in capitalism and they're seeing socialism as a solution. Uh, you like my League of Central Banksters cartoon? There's another funny one from Hedgeye. It has him dressed up as like Wonder Woman and Batman and Superman. It's funny too. No, I disagree. He says all finance, Pradeep says all finance professionals seem to be, again, no, it's a small minority, Pradeep. It's a maybe 10 or 20%. The majority of people who are mainstream financial professionals, investment banks and stuff, maybe off the record if they're drunk at a dinner party, you can get them to occasionally criticize the Fed. Most of them will not. It's a small minority of people. I know this because... Um, my podcast has cost me some uh, high-paying jobs, let's just say, in the financial industry. Um, the people want socialism. Yeah, it is fascism. Now, the people are starting who are educated and brainwashed at these universities want socialism, though. The people are blaming it on capitalism when it's really fascism. Look, having a central bank and not allowing bankruptcies for large corporations and giving corporations uh, almost unlimited cheap money and allowing them ridiculous credit ratings and a bunch of other perks, not allowing deflation. Look, the people need lower prices. The people need deflation. People on Main Street need deflation. They don't have enough savings. Deflation benefits the people. Lower prices getting higher quality goods and services for less money, more purchasing power, that benefits the average person. That incentivizes them to save more. Your savings become worth more over time. That's not being allowed. Um, China, Molekale, China has been using a version of MMT. So I was friends with some of these MMT people when I was just a stockbroker and starting to wake up and learning all this stuff in 2007, 2008, and 2009. And the MMT people back then, I'm sure they're going to disavow this, just like socialists disavow Venezuela and, and other failed states. But the MMT people back then were telling me how successful China was, how China was the model for MMT in the future. Uh, Aaron, capitalism actually benefits the average person a lot. You should read more Austrian School Economics. I recommend reading some of the basics from the Mises Institute. If you're questioning me on that, you haven't read any Austrian School Economics, any free market economics at all. Because they talk about how capitalism benefits the average person who's saving the most. I'm not a fan of Mike Norman. Let's just leave it at that. Um, if, he, if you need income, Mr. Freeze, this is just my opinion. Now, financial advice, rental properties. Your mortgage is almost definitely going to be inflated away. So if you have a renter in a halfway decent city where there's job growth, and there is cities in the United States where there still is job growth, rental property income, your mortgage will, mortgage will be inflated away. MMT is Keynesian economics on steroids. It's not as different as the MMT people claim. There's a lot of similar principles. Ultimately, it's all based off a variation of mercantilism. Everything can be taxed to death. If you're in the United States... And you have physical gold and silver, they could go after your gold and silver if you try to sell it on windfall profits tax. I made this point. What do you think rule number one is? They changed the rules. New taxes. 
Gold, if you're an American citizen, gold and silver taxes are already not good. The taxes on physical gold and silver here in the United States, there is no long-term capital gains tax. Daniel Amerman, A-M-E-R-M-A-N, did extensive work on the taxes for gold and silver. And if gold goes to $5,000 or $10,000 per ounce, the taxes on that are insane. It goes up to a higher tax bracket. He did the work on this. No, I don't like any of the real estate investment trusts. There's a lot of waste, fraud, corruption, and abuse in those. The governments can change the rules. So, yes, if you own rental properties, property taxes can go up. If you, own, if you only own physical gold and silver, they can put a new windfall profits tax. Or they can try to confiscate potentially, although a lot of people, Americans, do not own physical gold and silver. If you own Bitcoin, there could be a windfall profits tax. I have stressed this more than anyone else. The rules are going to change. If you think you're safe by just, I, I know someone who owns hundreds of rental properties. Okay, hundreds. He's very successful. He thinks he's diversified. He hates gold and silver. Do you think he's diversified? What if government puts rent control on a lot of his rental properties, even though he owns a lot of them in different cities and states all over the U.S.? What if there's higher property taxes? What if you only own gold and silver? Okay, this is the point I'm making. This is not financial advice, just my opinion. If you're all in on one thing and things look good now and you're doing well for a while, all of a sudden, snap, the rules could change. Well, I've been talking about the rules changes longer than anyone else because I've studied a lot of the financial history. I've been, If you're familiar with my channel, I've been talking about this for at least five years now, all the time. Call the rate decision? I don't do short-term trading. It probably looks like the Fed's going to rate cut. Why do you think they're going to hike the rates? Look, um, James Bullard gave that speech in London in the last two weeks, and he said they may cut in the near term, but he said if, they, if the data changes, they could rate hike. That, to me, shows how clueless the Fed is because those rate hikes almost broke everything. That's how leveraged the system is. Well, the futures, the betting market, the betting market for rate hikes, there's a betting market on this. It was priced the last time I looked at it last week was a 90% probability. Um, I've talked to business people who think that, that a lot of businesses will collapse if they go negative interest rate policy across the board. And the European Union is already starting to have enormous pushback from negative interest rate policy. There are pension funds, insurance companies, banks, businesses, savers getting killed from negative interest rate policy. So there's a, a lot of European central bankers that are beginning to question the efficacy of negative interest rate policy. So the rate cut odds changed. It was, it was closer to 90%. With Keynesian economics, there's always a liquidity trap. And no, most of the time they create their own liquidity trap. Thank you, William, for the super chat. I appreciate it. When will the recession officially hit? Um, I don't know officially. We're at 123 months and counting for the longest economic expansion in U.S. history now. There's a lot of data that the U.S. could be in a recession now, but I think they're going to keep things going until after the 2020 election. That's my best educated guess, that they'll keep things going somehow, some way, with more not QE. They'll ramp that up. We already have this guy, what's his name? I just read it a couple minutes ago. Mark Cabana, former employee at the New York Federal Reserve, saying that the Fed needs to do larger permanent repo facility, larger amounts of not QE. He's saying $60 billion per month in uh, treasury purchases is not enough. So if they ramp it up, if the Fed ramps it up, they can probably keep things going until after the 2020 election. But something will break. Mervyn King said he thinks that the next crisis will start outside the U.S. And I think there's a high probability of that. 
I know the gold community disagrees with me, but I think emerging markets have immense problems for a lot of different reasons. Uh, China has a lot of problems. The corporate bond market in the U.S. is a mess. The European Union and the European banking system is an absolute mess. So there's a lot of problems in the global economy. Okay, well, that's it for right now. I'll attach links to the articles in the information and description section, but I found it interesting, the comments that Mervyn King made. It seems he's being more honest than when he was actually head of the Bank of England, and he's calling for more, for less transparency and more secret meetings, which means to me that there's going to be more rules changes, unfortunately, and the average person is not going to be paying attention to the rules changes. They just don't have enough time or interest in paying attention to all the rules changes. And it's just not fair, but that's how life is. Life is not fair, but unfortunately, a lot of people are going to be like Charlie Brown, where Charlie Brown's backing up to kick the football, and Lucy, and he's running forward to kick the football, if you've ever seen that Peanuts cartoon, and Lucy pulls the football on him. Or the field goal's already up in the air, and the goalposts have been moved. So this is the new normal now, where QE, where quantitative easing was unconventional, years ago, and now the Fed has reworded everything. Danielle DiMartino Booth has talked about this, and now it's conventional. So I'll attach these articles in the information and description section. The other article, the three things uh, I learned from the Central Banker Conference here in Washington, D.C. over the weekend, I found that pretty interesting about all the contradictions that the central bankers were having. It just shows you the people that are saying that everything is going according to plan, that's not what I'm hearing. That's not what uh, that's not what I'm reading from different sources. That's not what I'm hearing from local sources over the years and from other comments from central banks. Okay, bye for now. I just want to thank my almost 200 now Patreon account contributors. It's growing very rapidly, up over fivefold in the last six months. So thank you so much to everyone for making my life a lot less stressful. You're allowing me to grow this small business, focus on quality content rather than you know, other things that I have to do in my life to hustle to make money, I could just do this. So it's paying the bills. Thank you very much to that. Um, thank you very much to everyone who's chipping in. Also, and um, I have a nine-page Sandstorm Gold article only for Patreon account contributors. I know I've gotten emails from other people that have sent me some money or asking if they could buy the report separately. For now, that's, a, that's just a promotion for people on my Patreon. And uh, thank you very much to my dozen or so monthly PayPal contributors. It's much appreciated. I actually make more money on uh, PayPal. They give me, they charge me less fees than I do on Patreon, but either one is fine. Um, the funny thing, I like su Super Chat is fine too if you throw me a Super Chat once in a while, but uh, Google and YouTube actually take out a massive amount. I, I, I think I get less than 40% of the Super Chat tips. Pretty sure I get less than 40% from looking at, at my uh, account statements of the money I make each month that tallying up the super chat amount of money and then the bottom line, what goes to me. It is what it is though. Plus, um, not only is YouTube taking more in super chat tips, they're making sure my channel doesn't grow, but um, that doesn't matter as long as I have enough money coming in from PayPal and Patreon. I'm gonna stay here and I'm gonna give you guys, I'm gonna work very hard trying to give you guys the best information, analysis, research, and financial education possible in my my best opinions and that's it for right now so everyone have a nice week and if there's any more interesting stories i will be covering them